What's up, everybody? Welcome to Building Our Power. This is Gabby. And KT. And we back with another episode. Make sure you hit us up at Building Our PWR. Hit KT up at KT on Square Does Art. Hit me up at Gabby's Music. We are back with a episode. Remember, if you would like to help us in the redistribution of funds, in the uh, feeding of the community, in the education of the community, you can do so. Link will be in the bio. As we said, we will. We are starting to do in-person distribution. Uh, that's what we're going to try to do, especially when it warms up starting in the spring. So we will start to uh, request some physical items in the future. So just be on the lookout for that, and uh, we'll keep y'all updated. Um, so today we are actually going to read and discuss literature by Lucy Parsons entitled The Principles of Anarchism. We're going to get through as much as we can, but we're going to try to keep it short. So if we got to divide it into parts, we will. Um, so KT, can you tell everybody a little bit about Lucy Parsons before we get into it? Of course. So Lucy Parsons uh, was born in 1851 and died in 1942. She was an American labor organizer, radical socialist, and anarcho-communist. Um, she was one of the founders of the Industrial Workers of the World and a member of other political organizations. Very influential. She had some beef with Emma Goldman. We did. Uh, we talked about her in one of our episodes. Uh, I can't remember which one it is. Y'all check it out. But yeah, we want to get more into the theory. We haven't read literature in a while. Um, so that's what we're going to do. All right, let's get started. The Principles of Anarchism. Comrades and friends, I think I cannot open my address more appropriately than by stating my experience in the long connection with the reform movement. It was during the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 that I first became interested in what is known as the labor question. I then thought, as many thousands of earnest, sincere people think, that the aggregate power operating in human society, known as the government, could be made an instrument in the hands of the oppressed to alleviate their sufferings. But a closer study of this origin, history, and tendency of governments convinced me that this was a mistake. So basically what Lucy Parsons was saying here, 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 at one point or another, she did think that, hey, we could use the government in order to stop the oppression of people so we could vote it out or we could, we could literally go through the government channels. Um, but then after researching the origin and the history and the tendencies of the government, so the United States, um, she definitely came to the idea or to the thought that, hey, this is not possible. Now, there is a portion here that says that majority rule is recognized as the only means of adjusting affairs. Gabby, what do you think about that? Okay, I think there's different ways to look at it. Uh, one way is that because of the way that the voting system is set up, we have a majority rule. We have the quote-unquote democracy. Right. Uh, with majority rule, look at the politicians. Look at how we only have two, two parties. Because of majority rule, we are not able to have like 20, 30, 40 parties because it's only one vote. We only have one presidential election. That's it. Yep. And uh, there's no there's no time, there's no value given to people who do not have the numbers, the numbers of power. Like us, us saying free housing, free health care, uh, everybody get food. Like we're seeing this outlier, so we're not going to be taken seriously in the media. We're not going to be taken seriously uh to most layman people. So because of that, it's easier for the 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 elites to stay in control. They control the narratives. They control uh for a lot of people how they think, how they view the world. So if we're painted as outliers, we're painted as whatever. It's it's just easier it's easier to squash when we do things. It's easier to squash movements. Think about the Black Lives Matter movement again. Think of how there was all types of people, but there was a lot of anarchists, communists, leftists, whatever. But because of majority rule, the presidential election, they were able to consolidate all those people into the Democratic Party and then it's nothing. Yeah. 
I agree with you. I think another really good um, way to think of it would be like replace majority rule with like capitalism and, and the uh, the ideals of the quote unquote American way. So majority rules, capitalism basically rules. So at any time, at any no matter what, they can always oppress you in some way with capitalism. Whether that be they're going to take you off of unemployment. Whether that be they're going to just pretend like a pandemic that's been going on for three years is no longer happening. So at the end of the day, yeah, I agree. At the end of the day, they're going to literally do whatever they can do in order to silence people who are standing up against capitalism and against the current government and against the system. All right, so uh, next part. Okay, so I came to understand that such concentrated power can always be wielded in the intent of the few and at the expense of many. Government, in its last analysis, is the power reduced to a science. Governments never lead, they follow progress. When the prison, stake, or scaffold can no longer silence the voice of the protesting minority, progress moves on to a step, but not until then. I will state this contention in another way. I learned by close study that it made no difference what fair promises a political party out of power might make to the people in order to secure their confidence. When once securely established in control of the affairs of the society that they were after all but human with all the human attributes of the politician. Among these are, first, to remain in power at all hazards, if not individually, then these holding essentially the same views as the administration must be kept in control. Second, in order to keep in power, it's necessary to build up a powerful machine, one strong enough to crush all opposition and silence all vigorous murmurs of discontent. Or the party machine might be smashed and the party thereby lose control. When I came to realize the faults, failing, shortcomings, aspirations, and ambitions of fallible man, I concluded that it would not be the safest nor best policy for society as a whole to entrust the management of all its affairs with all their manifold deviations and ramifications in the hands of finite man to be managed by the party which happened to come into power and therefore was the majority party. Nor did it then, nor does it now, make one particle of difference to me what a party out of power may promise. It does not tend to allay my fears of a party when entrenched and securely seated in power might do to crush opposition and silence the voice of the minority and thus delay the onward step of progress. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So pretty much what that first paragraph that KT read was talking about Lucy Parsons pretty much theorizing that power in itself will make people oppressors. Um, so like people will promise like when they on the campaign, nobody knows them. Oh, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll do this. I'll do that. But uh, according to Lucy, uh, her point was that, you know, they have to stay in power. A person in power wants to stay in power. And because of that, they are going to put people in power that are going to reinforce what they believe. They're not going to put no dissent in there. And then in, also, in order to stay in power, you must be able to crush any opposition. A party in power is not going to allow opposing views just come in there willy-nilly in order to shake stuff up. Um... Yeah, and, you know, if if you cannot, what Lucy says, too, towards the end in that first paragraph is, like, if you cannot do that, then the party essentially will lose power. So we wonder why the Democratic and the Republican Party and the United States as a whole has continued for all of these years, for all these decades and centuries. And it's because they have never, never went against the grain. They have never went in uh, some sort of situation that would go against them and themselves in power currently. They would never do anything to jeopardize that. And if they did, they would lose power as a completely, like, as a party themselves. So, uh, in the second one, I ba I'm basically getting from that that Lucy's like, you know what, um, I don't really care. I could really give a flying fuck 
uh, basically whether or not there's a party in power. Uh, because at the end of the day, there's not going to be any progress as long as the majority is ruled. The part where she's like, uh, nor did it then, nor does it now make one particle of difference to me what a party out of power may promise. That that right there is just basically like, I don't give a fuck. Yes. All right, next part. My mind is appalled at the thought of a political party having control of all the details that go to make up the sum of our total lives. Think of it for an instant, that the party in power shall have all authority to dictate the kind of books that should be used in our schools and universities. Government officials editing, printing, and circulating our literature, histories, magazines, and press to say nothing of the thousand and one activities of life that a people engage in in a civilized society. To my mind, the struggle for liberty is too great, and the few steps we have gained have been won a too great a sacrifice for the great mass of people of the 20th century to consent to turn over to any political party the management of our social and industrial affairs. For all who are at all familiar with history know that men will abuse power when they possess it. For these and other reasons, I, after careful study and not through sentiment, turn from a sincere, earnest political socialist to a non-political phase of socialism anarchism. Because in his philosophy, I believe I can find the proper conditions for the fullest development of the individual units in society, which can never be the case under government restrictions. Yes. So pretty much saying, like, why, why do we need a government body telling us, dictating, like pretty much what we talked about the last episode, dictating every part of our life, dictating the education we have, dictating uh what information we are given dictating what we gonna do when we gonna do it and all that type of stuff um because again going back to that fact that i mean you can even look historically even for a lot of countries that meant well in the beginning that were fighting for the liberation of the people and did many great things many great things there was also, because they were in power, they had to maintain that power. Yep. And because of that, yes, yeah, some of the dissenters were legitimately trying to destroy the country and trying to do things for Western interests and stuff like that. But it, it can get to the point where just regular people airing grievances can become a threat. So even that becomes squashed. And so it's like it's defeating the purpose and that's what happens when you allow parties, when you have parties, when you allow a, a subset of people govern, pretty much. Yeah, a hierarchy, yeah, basically. The hierarchy, yeah. Yeah, when that hierarchy starts happening, it, it just falls right back into that same process, is essentially what she's saying. It falls right back into capitalism. It falls right back into um, some sort of oppression, whether that's capitalism or uh, a vanguard oppressing people. Like, literally. Yeah, not, not necessarily not capitalism, even just capitalism yeah. but just oppression. I mean, anybody can oppress. It's not, there's no secret formula for which kind of people, what kind of structures can oppress. Every structure can be used to oppress. Some just start out automatically from the jump as oppressive, a.k.a. capitalism. But, yeah, I, I definitely see what she's saying. I think it's interesting, like, like what she says. Like, she basically is like, you know, after I have went through literally everything I can think of, after I've been through this political string of, of time where, you know, I wanted to do the whole politics type thing with the government and things like that. I finally have came to the realization that if there's a hierarchy involved, it's not, it's not possible. I think, I think for us too, like that's kind of the process that we kind of went through ourselves is like at one point or another, we were like, Oh yeah, Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders. And then it came to, no, actually, that's not true. We can't do that. So, yeah, I really like Lucy Parsons, and I like this little reading thingy. The philosophy of anarchism is included in the word liberty, yet it is comprehensive enough to include all things else that are conducive to progress. No barriers whatever to human progression, to thought, or investigation are placed by anarchism. 
Nothing is considered so true or so certain that future discoveries may not prove it false. Therefore, it has but one infallible, unchangeable motto, freedom. Freedom to discover any truth. Freedom to develop, to live naturally and fully. Other schools of thought are composed of crystallized ideas, principles that are caught and impaled between the planks of long platforms and considered too sacred to be disturbed by a close investigation. In all other issues, there is always a limit, some imaginary boundary line beyond which a searching mind dare not penetrate. Least some pet idea melt into a myth. But anarchism is the usher of science, the master of ceremonies to all forms of truth. It would remove all barriers between the human being and natural development. From the natural resources of the earth, all artificial restrictions that the body might be nurtured, and from universal truth, all bars of prejudice and superstition that the mind may develop symmetrically. Anarchists know that a long period of education must precede any great fundamental change in society. Hence, they do not believe in vote begging nor political uh, campaigns, but rather in the development of self-thinking individuals. We look away from government for relief because we know that force legalized invades the personal liberty of man, seizes upon the natural elements, and intervenes between men or man in natural laws. From this exercise of force through governments flows nearly all the misery, poverty, crime, and confusion existing in society. So that first part, I think, was like a dig to, you know, the Marxist, Leninists, and <laughs> the socialists, pretty much saying that anarchism, or this type of anarchism is ever-evolving, um just according to the times, according to what is needed at the time, according to the trajectory of the planet. Um, and it's it's limitless in the possibilities and in the ways that it can can happen. Right. Um, but we have certain doctrines, certain philosophies, certain uh, political thought that it seemed to be too sacred to even... Uh, shake up a little bit, and we we've experienced that plenty of times when we call out Marxists, Marx, Lenin, all them people, any of them them white men, any of the men in general. When we say anything that slightly says, well, maybe this or maybe that, we get droves of people. You're not really a Marxist, Lenin. You're the feds. You're this. You're We're that. We're always the feds because at a certain point, like. Lucy said, there's a boundary. Like, you can go so far with Marxist Leninism, but then when you go just an inch further, when you talk about land back, when you talk about just give, yeah, giving all the indigenous people their land back, when you talk about reparations, when you talk about uh, black people being liberated all over the country, wherever. Um, Abolishing then, things. Yeah, then then it's like, oh, woo, woo, woo. But... Cause it, cause it's always like, well, let, let me go back to the book. What does the book say? What what did this person say? What did that person say? It's not really using what you're supposed to be using dialectical materialism to guide you and to figure out what's going on. Right. And uh, I think that's really a Western thing. I think we talked about this, that like the uh, the similarities between the way that we practice religion, Christianity, and the way that the we Westerners. Uh, practice political thought as a yes. religion that cannot be questioned that cannot that can't be challenged you know what i'm saying so that's kind of what she was saying there um and i like i think i think like we've if you ever been on twitter and you've ever been in any type of discourse at all on twitter or even in leftist spaces i think that's kind of where like i don't think this is just a dig at marxist i think this is literally a dig at any any type of person whose any sort of political ideology does not encourage you uh, to constantly be building, burning it down if it doesn't work, and rebuilding. Yeah. And uh, well, honestly, uh, an interesting thing about this, though, is she says this. This is the principle of, of anarchism. But her and Emma Goldman got into that beef because Emma Goldman said, you don't know what you want. You trying to be this and yes. you trying to be that and you're trying to be this and you trying to be that. And she's like, I'm an anarchist. I'm just trying to figure out what's going to work. 
y'all come up with a title and that that guides you through the rest of your life. Y'all ain't y'all ain't ever trying to evolve and ever trying to learn and uh, figure things out. Um, I I want to relate it to like at least for myself, like I'm gender fluid. I'm I'm queer as all queer happens, and so like for me, I think of like political ideology, like. With gender fluidity, I'm I'm literally always either uh, I'm changing it up, right? And so I feel like you need to be doing that always with political ideology. You need to be changing it up. If it, if it's not working, if it is hurting someone, if it is oppressing someone, it's got to go. If it's not working, I'm if it's not working, if it's not fitting you, if it's not uh being adjusted in the in the correct direction change it and then you know what maybe you might be able to come back to it if it works at a different time nothing is the political imagination can go forever and it can come back to now and then it can go forever again yeah but i, I want to say it ain't necessarily based upon how you feel it should be based upon material conditions it should be based upon the world and what what you see works within your own right. life and with other people it's not necessarily I wouldn't say it's something that's just like just pick something for today. Um, no, but it, it is ever changing. Though. Yeah, 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 for sure. All right. Um. So, next part. So we perceive there are actual material barriers blockading the way. These must be removed. If we could hope they would melt away or be voted or prayed into nothingness, we would be content to wait and vote and pray. But they are like great frowning rocks towering between us and the land of freedom, while the dark chasms of hard-fought past yawn behind us. Crumbling, they may be with their own weight and the decay of time, but to quietly stand under until the fall is to be buried in the crash. There is something to be done in a case like this. The rocks must be removed. Passivity, while slavery is stealing over us, is a crime. For the moment, we must forget that we are anarchists. When the work is accomplished, we may forget that we were revolutionists. Hence, most anarchists believe the coming change can only come through a revolution because the possessing class will not allow a peaceful change to take place. Still, we are willing to work for peace at any price, except the price of liberty. And what of the glowing beyond that is so bright that those who grind the faces of the poor say it's a dream? It is no dream. It is the real. Stripped of brain distortions materialized into thrones and scaffolds, miters and guns. It is nature acting on her own interior laws as in all her other associations. It is a return to the first principles. For were not the land, the water, the light, all free before governments took shape and form? In this free state, we will again forget to think of these things as property. It is real for we as a race are growing up to it. The idea of less restrictions and more liberty and a confiding trust that nature is equal to her work is permeating all modern thought. Okay, so we're going to tackle this and we're going to be done with it uh, for today. <laughs> all right, so the beginning part, KT, what do you think about that? Um, she's, she's basically saying that she, like what we were just saying, that voting, praying, doing all these things that you guys have been doing all this time, it's not working essentially is what she's saying here. And and at this point, we need to figure out something different. Uh, we need to figure out, well, not we need to figure out, we know that the option here is to essentially start a, a revolution, start a, a war with the United States government, essentially, is what she's saying. Yeah, she compares it to rocks. She compares it to rocks towering over your head. Right. That are crumbling and going to fall. It's just instead of you. praying, you can't pray the rock mm -hmm. away. You can't vote the rock away. You can't wait the rock away. That weight is going to fall on your head. The only way you can get that rock from under your head, if you can't move, is to remove the rock. I like that she says, uh, the possessing class will not allow peaceful change to take place. Still, we are willing to work for peace at any price, except at the price of liberty. Like, okay, we're not going to sit here, and we're not going to be capitalist with you. We're not going to be uh, racist with you. We're not going to do this. We will not do this. We will be liberated. We may, after we get liberated, be peaceful, but until then, like, we're, we're just not going to do it. 
we're not going to do it. And pretty much saying that the government is not playing a peaceful game. Right. So, if the government was playing a peaceful game, we could do things peacefully, but they're not. So we have to do what we can do to get stuff done, pretty much. The second part um, that you read, Gabby, basically to me, is she's saying like, wow, you guys really have the audacity to sit here and tell me that it's a dream or this is fake and like I shouldn't feel this way because it's never going to be achievable. Uh, but the the real, the truth is, is that this is real life. This is what I'm experiencing daily and what I know to be true. So, yeah, I think um, as we've read this, and like I've told Gabby before, but I really like what Lucy Parson says in regards to anarchism. Um, but what do you think, Gabby, about that second part? Yeah, what she was saying is uh, this is her thought, her concept was a thought that wasn't corrupted by guns or uh, powerful or any type of outside influence. And she was saying, all I'm saying is, I'm not even saying I'm crazy. I'm saying let's get back to how we used to live. Back in the day, one of those things is property. One of those things is real estate. One of those things is stocks and bonds. There's no reason why why this world there is people acting like this is it's a rule. People act like this life is real. Mm-hmm. They really do. But it's people all made act up. like I mean the only things that's really stopping you is there's gravity. That's that you you ain't finna fight against gravity unless you have some type of equipment or whatever. There's gravity, there's time. But that just tells you every rule can be broken. You know what I'm saying? Like every single rule. Well, time, I don't know about that. But, can be broken. But but there's certain things, like, okay, th- those things are real. But all this other stuff, like uh uh school grades, like investments, like retirement, like pensions. Like, uh, vacation. Like, all this stuff is just made up. So, we're playing along, the proletariat. We're playing along because we've been convinced that this is the only way. Mm-hmm. When the only people that are, the people that are convincing us this are the people that are benefiting from it. Yep. But if one day we say we're about to deprogram from this life, we don't have to do this. I don't have to go to work. I'm going to just take care of myself. I'm going to go somewhere and do whatever. That would be a threat. And so they use words like, well, that's just a dream. Well, that's not real. What do you mean? Folks have been doing this. We've been doing this since we got here as human beings. What are you talking about? This is a dream. Y'all the one that created all this stuff. So that's something, too, that that you can take. we can take to heart and, and try to tell other people. They'll say stuff is utopian when it's like this is basic stuff. Get land, grow food, uh... Make clothes, uh, get shelter, um, you, you're sick, get medicine. Uh, I don't see what, what really is the big holdup. I think the holdup is that, like we talked about on our previous episode, is that people have constantly been told from the get-go how things are supposed to work, right? So it's very, very scary for some people to be like, oh, and even myself, like, if I can't get my medicine, what am I going to do, you know? Like, oh, wh- well, what happens if capitalism isn't here? Oh, they, I, they have no political imagination outside of that. But that's where I think organizing comes in, right? And where we need to start building more relationships with people in our communities and organizing with people in our communities is there may be somebody out there that can literally make be property on for me. And I not have to buy it from the store. And I might not even have to buy it from the store. And instead, I can literally uh, barter my way through that. Like, we we don't think of those things because capitalism doesn't provide us the, the thought process to do that. They say, this is the way it is, and this is the way it's always been, and we're going to keep it this way. They keep that on 24-7, and anybody that, that rises up and tries to educate other people... On that, they will get uh, they will get squashed by any means necessary. Yep. Uh, I was just doing some reading. We're gonna have to do an episode on it about uh, when the communists came to Memphis back in the day, and just the links that the government went to 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 squash any type of organizing of the poor and poor white and poor black workers. Um, this has been this has been years in the making. This has literally been decades and centuries in the making so that if you even say communism, if you even say anarchism, anarchism, people think craziness, destroying things. 
uh, fires burning, everybody getting shot and killed. They don't even think about, wait, I don't have to clock into a boss. I don't have to worry about where my next meal is. I don't, have to, I don't have to worry about paying rent. I don't have to worry about being on the streets. Like, they, it, so it, it's just going to take a lot of reprogramming and, and, and a lot of education. And, and that's what we're trying to do. And that's what we're going to continue to do. Um, so that's all we're going to do for today. There's uh, a lot more to get to. You know, we likes to talk. <laughs> but uh, tell us what you think so far about this this piece of work, Principles of Anarchism. And, uh, yeah, let us know in the comments. We really enjoying this, of course. Uh, if you would like to hit us up, you can do so at Building Our PWR. If you'd like to donate to what we're doing, the educating, the feeding, the redistribution of funds, you can do so. Link is in the bio. You can hit KT up at KT underscore does art. You can hit me up at Gat Beats Music. And that's all. And this is Building Our Power.